Divine Truth Assistance Group Group Assistance Sessions Putting Principles of Divine Truth into Action This recording is from the Understanding God's Loving Laws Group and is part of an Education in Love series. In the Human Transformation Principles presentation, Jesus briefly summarizes God's principles of human transformation that govern the operation of God's laws and determine the human soul's future potential and gives examples of the way these principles are built into God's laws. Recorded on the 26th of November, 2016, in New Seville, Queensland, Australia. Now we come to uh, one of the exciting things about what God's offered as a gift as well, human transformation principles. (laughs) Not enough can be said about these principles, of course. And the reality is that we still don't know everything about them. So it's going to be many, many billions of years, I believe, before we know like, what I'd consider to be a good enough amount of knowledge <laughs> about them. Um, human transformation principles. Let's have a look at them. All right, well, the first thing we need to do is discuss with you the principle of multiple universes. So we saw that there's a hierarchy principle, right? Now, if the hierarchy principle applies with creation, it must also apply to universes. And remember, the way I've drawn to you in the past is things like the spheres. So you have the Earth, and then you have, remember, we have sphere one, Two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, 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 right? We've got all these spheres. Well, can you see in a way they are hierarchical places of existence? Can you see that? But they all are uh, contained within one, one single physical universe. So here's the physical universe. Right? And here's the Earth existing. Of course, it's not in the scale. <laughs> right? And then we've got the spheres that revolve around the Earth, which don't physically revolve around the Earth, but they are linked to the Earth in terms of places of progression in, and delineated or separated by love. And love creates this interstellar boundary between each sphere. So between the first sphere, you could, you could draw this first sphere like a little slice of an orange, and the second sphere like a slice of an orange too that's larger than first and contains the first, but is like a slice of orange, then there's an interstellar boundary between the two, which is a, a condition of love and so forth. And these boundaries keep going, keep going around the Earth, and there are actually 35 of them around our Earth, so if we drew 35 of them (laughs) around this Earth, right? There we go. There's our Earth, right? And that's contained within the physical universe. And then there are some other Earths, which also have the same number of spheres, interstellar boundaries around that, right? And then you have another Earth, same goes, right? And another Earth, let's scoot it up here and cluster it. And another Earth, imagine all the spheres around that as well. And they are all contained within one single universe, right? Then we have a wrapper of this universe, which I'll draw in purple which are the laws that govern it. So they are the laws, and they, this is the actual physical universe, which includes the spheres around each Earth. And there's, I think, from memory, five or six of them, one or the two. Um, so, so we have, and that's contained within the physical universe, that if you could go out into space as far as you could go, eventually you'd find some other Earths. Does that make sense? Yep. 
and there's an interstellar boundary between them, and there's, there's be, the, none of them meet, actually, right up to the 35th sphere. They don't meet at all. They're still separated by boundaries, and the boundaries are only able to be um, traversed, I suppose you could call it, through your condition of love. Then we have a soul universe that contains all of that. And the soul universe is where all the souls are, including yours right now. Now, I'm representing this in a two-dimensional form, <laughs> but it's actually multi-dimensional, th uh, 36 dimensions at this stage. So, so to draw it in a multi-dimensional form, it actually is one inside of the other, really. In multi and, and in fact, they even contain the same space, but, but in a different dimension. Right? But it gets pretty complicated mathematically. I think the fastest supercomputer on Earth at the moment can calculate the existence of 13 dimensions. Um, but beyond that, I don't think any, we have any computer on Earth that, that can actually calculate mathematically whether a 14th dimension actually exists or not. But anyway, we have the soul, which is in the unified state, although in, for all of those people in this condition, right up to the time they make a transition of awareness into this state, they, they are, the soul is basically in a, uh, you could say, a sort of a separator state, isn't it? Where the awareness separates the two halves. And once you make the transition into this state, you become aware. But, but there are other souls here, of course, who, who, which is your soul right now, in an unaware state. And there's newly incarnated souls. I suppose you could draw them a little smaller, couldn't you? Because they're not yet developed. But they are in an unincarnated state. They're yet to even perceive their own existence. So many only perceive their own existence as a half. And then there's some, the red one I've drawn there, that uh, eventually you would get to the stage where, and let's draw it as a blue one, where we completely perceive our own existence as a whole. And interestingly enough, that soul's power, conceiving itself as a whole, is able to control absolutely everything in this universe. Right? That's how much power it has. Right? So that's... But it only has that power in an aware state. And it only has that power because it's received God's love. Right? So now you can see there's hierarchical universes, there's even hierarchical spheres, is there not? And hierarchical universes containing multiple universes of a lower hierarchical type. And then we've got a physical universe, is the area of this boundary, the physical, that contains all of the physical and the metaphysical. If you think of it this way, it is where the half of a soul needs bodies to experience itself. So the, this universe had to be created by God to allow for bodies to exist in it that could be connected to the soul so that the half of the soul in an unaware state is able to experience itself. Make sense? So that's that. And then the soul universe, which is the current high, highest known universe at this stage, is the human-based hierarchical universe that is perceived by the soul senses in a soul union condition, where the two halves are fully aware, fully self-aware. Make sense to you so far? Yeah. So, so of course, who knows what this soul can do after that, this soul potentially could expand and create other hierarchical universes. Or it could be that we create, like, there might be a whole series of spheres in this universe that get created, only to find out that the soul is not the highest creation. But rather there might be some other part of us that we've not yet become aware of that might be the highest creation. We don't know, really, do we? Right? So... It's only a process of discovery that's going to make, that, make us aware of that. So you could say that this truth is only the truth at the moment. 
Make sense to you? Yeah? Sandra, you'd like to ask? Is the um, soul universe also compartmented with some spheres so that the unified souls don't intermingle with the unaware no. souls? No, the unified souls can actually observe every wow. un soul that's not yet unified or partially, partially in the process of unification. It can also see all of the unincarnated souls as well. But we don't see them, like we don't, we're no, not you, aware of the you The unincarnated guys. souls are not aware of what they see, because okay. yeah, they're, not, they're not yet, you could say they're not born yet, and not, they haven't incarnated yet in order to become self-aware. Remember the incarnation process is the process of a soul, each half of the soul initially, becoming self-aware through the incarnation process. So the, the very first incarnation process, which is the process of conception, which happens at conception, is the actual first part of the soul's awareness and the soul's awareness does not complete until it reaches this unified state then you could say you're fully aware and you could basically say incarnation the, pro the full process of incarnation is now complete when because now it's aware. fully aware mm -hmm. yeah so we're basically like an unincarnated soul still like almost in some we're ways not becoming we're aware of ourselves well you're not aware of your other half yet you see for, for the majority of you not emotionally aware of the other half even so that means that, that you're still in a fairly unaware state, right? There's, a, there's growing awareness. Mm. And that God's created everything to grow uh, just because of the development principle. You can see that that is going to occur, this growth is going to occur. And God created that way so that you can have the experience of growing mm. and therefore the experience of learning, the experience of self-determination and so forth. All of those things are gifts from God that God's offered you and, uh, and we embrace them or, or resist them, depending on our conditions generally. But at the end, in the end, God's trying to assist us to become aware. Now, can you see in amongst all of that diagram, the sixth sphere is quite a limited state. Thank so you. the problem with not connecting to God means that you cannot, you cannot actually make the transition between the sixth and the seventh sphere without a connection to God. So you can see that the connection to God becomes extremely important to gaining awareness beyond that state of the sixth sphere. So sixth sphere spirits really in a lot of ways have a lot of a lack of awareness, even though they, when you talk to them, they don't believe they have. Right? Usually they have quite a feeling that oh, I know a lot now. And sure, they know a lot more right, than any person on earth knows right? by, by factors of thousands. Right, but they are still, from God's perspective, living in an unaware state because they're unaware of God. So they're living in an unaware state about the universe. Make sense? Okay. So there are the terms we're using. Let's have a look at the terms about transformation. So transformation is the potentiality offered to the human soul with, no, with what? Firstly, it needs to have this thing called desire remember we've talked about desire now for the last two days in particular very important factor in fact it's not a will-based process at all it's a desire based process it's only desire that activates this process does to exceed its original created condition and potentials as a human and to allow God's personal love to be absorbed by the soul in order to transform the soul into an immortal divine creature with the potential of infinite expansion, but not becoming as God is. Why, how, why is that? Because God is infinite, and can we ever become infinite if we're inside of God? Of course we cannot, but we can approach the infinite, can we not? Of course. So transformation principles must be the most complex principles of all principles because imagine how many laws they involve. They involve all the laws that govern every single one of the spheres from the 30 to the 35th. They involve the laws that govern the soul universe itself. Plus they involve the so human soul, which is the most complex of God's creations. And in fact, the human soul is still more complex than every single one of those universes and all the matter added together, put together. It's, the human soul is still more complex. One soul is more complex than all that. Uh, 
So you imagine how many laws must be involved. The laws also include laws pertaining to how that soul can influence the two bodies and actually create other bodies, because it can do. It can create hundreds or potentially thousands of bodies to express itself in the lower spheres. Does that make sense? And all of those laws are also governed and known by the soul in that state. So can you see it's a highly complex set of principles, but with one very simple driving mechanism called desire. Interesting, hey? It's just amazing when you think about it. Just, it's a very simple, in the sense of simple to understand principle, but highly complex when it comes to examining the scientific process of examining the ma and mathematical process of examining the laws. Yeah. Interesting. So that's transformation. So let's look at what it does, these principles. They allow desire-driven transformation from the human soul into a divine soul. So remember, we, and, we, and we've used that term purposefully so that you can see it's this desire thing that has to be engaged. Right? It allows desire-driven absorption of God's attributes by the human soul. So again, desire-driven, I'm allowing God to actually change my soul. Now remember, I've got self-determination. God has given me that. So allowing someone else to change you is quite a pretty way out there concept, actually. And, and if you think about how much many of you don't even let your partner change you, you can see that when it comes to God changing you, most of you have a huge amount of resistance there, right? But but it's really a joyful experience if you let it happen. But it means trusting someone above trusting yourself. And most of us don't do that, right? Most of us trust only ourselves. It allows the entire soul to join in full self-awareness in that condition. It allows the whole soul to see at, at that condition. It assigns the gift of immortality to the soul that transforms. So now this soul is in that transformed state. And in fact, the gift of immortality begins the instant that the soul receives God's love. And that can happen in the first sphere or on earth. That can happen when you're in the hells. So you can actually start to receive God's love in the hells. And once that's happened, no, there's no way you, you'll, ever be, you, you'll ever die again or potentially die. The trouble is, though, you don't know that until you reach the 8th sphere. So you still think you might be able to die until you reach the 8th sphere. But once you reach the 8th sphere, the t one half now becomes aware that it's a whole soul and it can never die. Right? And then when the other so half of the soul reaches the 8th sphere, it becomes aware of that. But there's still things that they need to do to join. Right? There's changes they need to make to join with each other. Can you see the first part of the process is about trusting God completely with all of your heart and being completely God-reliant until you get to the eighth sphere? And then the second part is trusting the opposite half of yourself. Interesting. To the point where you actually merge and you become one. Right. So the first part is about trusting God and the second part is learning to fully trust each half, of the, other, uh, the other half of your soul. Until you get to the point where not only do you trust it, but their emotions are yours, your emotions are theirs, your, their feelings are yours, your feelings are theirs, their senses are yours, your senses are theirs, your thoughts are the, yours and theirs, and your, their thoughts are yours. Do you follow? Yeah? Laura, I'd like to ask. If you've trusted God to the point of getting to the eighth sphere and you know that your other half has done the same process and you, all the sin is removed, w why isn't it easy to trust the other half when there is no sin? Well, I think you could easily answer that yourself, couldn't you, Laura? You don't trust anybody, do you, at this stage? Yeah, because I'm in sin and they're in sin. And yeah, but it's easier to trust an infinite being who you know has your interests at heart than it is to trust a person who's identical to you who potentially might have other issues. 
That's what yeah. I'm saying. When you're at one, when you're both at one with God, yeah, Laura, are there still issues? I've answered the question. Of course, there's still issues because you you you're still separate from your other half. Of course, there's issues. Uh, if there's not issues, you would be joined, would you not? Yeah, I just thought there would be no one loving your issues. I know you think that, yeah. <laughs> but the reality is, it, it, there's there's eight sphere, thirty five sphere. How many spheres in between? Uh, so 27 spheres where you learn to trust the other half. <laughs> it's going to take a lot longer to trust the other half than it is to trust God. That's the message, isn't it? It's going to be a lot longer to be completely open to emotional absorption of your other half than it is to have an emotional absorption of God's love, which is not a full emotional absorption of God, is it? It's only an emotional absorption of one of God's attributes, love. So the reality is when we're in a seven, eight sphere condition, we haven't fully absorbed God. We've only absorbed God's love, one attribute of God. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, so don't think you've fully absorbed God in that, in that condition because you have not. You've only fully absorbed one attribute of God. That's all you've absorbed. Right? And there, there's other attributes of God that God adds to the process that you need, that you're going to need, in order to absorb your other half. So, so every seven sphere transition, there's another attribute of God that you need to absorb. And we won't go into that at this stage because obviously we need to get to the first stage first. But there are other attributes of God, every seventh sphere transition. So transition from the seventh to eighth is the God's love attribute. From the from the if you mul if you add seven to eight, you get what? Fifteen. So the fifteen to sixteen transition is another attribute of God gets added to your soul that allows you to eventually get the stage where you can absorb the other half. And actually the other half has to get to that same condition in order for them to absorb you. And remember it's a two stage process. It's not just one of you deciding to do this now, two of you need to decide to do it and you need to have a complete desire to do it. You can't, it's not, you're not, it's not forced upon you. So it's not driven by some external forces that say you've got to do it. It's something that you choose to do through your desire and each half of you have to choose to do it. So, so you might choose to do it but the other half chooses not to for a long time. You don't know how long that might be. And obviously one of the goals you'll have is to help that person make that transition, wouldn't it be? Yep. Okay. It also assigns the potential of infinite expansion and expression to the human soul. So beyond this point, there's the potential obviously now to grow even more. And like I've said to you many times before, I sort of see that point as like sitting on, baby sitting in God's arms, ready to learn the next, the next thing. Until that point, you're not ready to learn the next thing. Right. Because you don't have the soul capacity to even absorb the information of the next thing until you get to that point. You follow? Okay. So, so and this is, this, these principles are a gift of God. They're, they're not a, you don't have to do them. It's completely up to you. Driven by desire. What, what do, you, do you want to do it or not is the real question. But it's completely driven by desire. Let's look at some examples because I think it's important to examine some examples. Interesting thing about prayer. Remember all this, if we rub this part about here, all this that we've drawn here on the board, messily, of course, um, it still exists within the infinite, doesn't it? And it exists within the wrapper of God's Principles. So remember, God's principles are still here. So the principles are here, still governing. And in fact, the universe is expand within the principles. And the principles are all have all got an infinite component because they are a part of God's principles. They they are part of God's personality and nature. They are all infinite. And so the universe actually expands within the governing factor of the principles. And You've got God's personality and nature that defines the principles. Of 
and you've still got God, the entity that contains those things. Do you follow? So we've still got that same layer, but we've now, we've now put a whole heap of things in the middle of it that actually are existing right now. Of course, when God first created it, there was only the physical creations and one sphere. And humans created five of those spheres through their degradation. And humans created the other spheres left over, the 30, uh, 29 different spheres ab above the sixth. Humans created those through their developed condition. Does that make sense? So eventually it came to that before we could make the transition to awareness of this condition, awareness of that universe. Now, any being in that universe is fully aware, because it contains these things, is fully aware of everything going on in here. Right? Fully aware of what's going on at this level, the physical level. Yeah. Okay, we'll just look more at prayer now. Prayer allows God, the infinite, one of God's feelings, right? So you could say, obviously, God's nature involves God's feelings. So it allows one of God's feelings to actually go from God, the infinite. Well, I might go for another colour now. So let's say God's love, this is now, that gets transmitted from the infinite to the soul which exists in that universe. So prayer is not governed by laws that contain any universe because God's love comes from outside of the universe and enters the soul-based universe. So prayer is not actually governed by laws that control the universe. <clears throat> prayer is governed by obviously something much greater, something that exists in God, actually. So God directly governs prayer, the communicative process between the human soul and God of prayer, the energy flow, if you like, of desire between God, the human and God, the human soul and God, is governed by God, not by the laws. So it's a direct connection with God. Right? But it still does have laws that govern it, but those laws are not, Governing, no, not governed by the universal laws that we're governed by. Because if they were, they wouldn't go anywhere beyond those universes. They have to be governed by something outside of us. Still governed by, obviously, God's nature, laws involving the process of God's nature, but, but they're not governed by the laws that govern the universes. So pr since prayer begins in the soul of God and enters the soul of the human, and the, remember, the soul of the human exists, whether aware or not, in the soul universe condition. Since prayer enters in that regard, you can see that God is not contained by any universe, but contains all universes. So the laws that govern the transformation of things between us and God obviously are external or beyond all the universes. Okay, everyone's a bit quiet about that. <laughs> so transformation principles, these principles, transformation principles, allow prayer to even exist as a, as a concept and as an actual fact. It's the transformation principles that actually allow for us to pray. pray prayer is a desire to receive the gift of God's love. Of course, if we have an expectation to receive it, it's no longer a gift, so we're not going to receive it. That's one of the laws that govern the transmission of prayer. The Holy Spirit is the conduit by which God's soul transmits the substance of love from God to the human soul and desire on the part of the human which is faith remember desire is the same as saying our current faith is what 
Paul's prayer, pulls the Holy Spirit to you that allows the connection. But since all principles are based on the other aspect of love, which is truth, <laughs> the Holy Spirit also can only operate upon a sincere, pure desire. Mm. Clever little system, huh? Prayer is an emotion felt within the soul, but since the soul is connected to the bodies, prayer feels like it's coming from the bodies. It's just a, it's a awareness issue, though. The reality is prayer comes from the soul, and actually God, do, God does not actually respond by giving God's love to the bodies. The bodies feel the benefits of the reception of God's love into the soul because the soul being in a different dimensional space, has control over both the bodies. So therefore the bodies receive the benefits of the love, but the love doesn't go directly to the bodies, it goes to the bodies via the soul, not to the bodies directly. Make sense, everyone? Yeah. Okay. Interesting fact, of course, if prayer was coming, say, from the brain of your physical body, which is down here sitting on earth, right? <laughs> and let's say God wasn't that far away, or seemingly uh, you, you think of God as that far away, but actually God's not very far away, given that your soul's here and you actually are inside of God. That means God completely surrounds you, actually, from a dimensional perspective. But, but if prayer... If God was existing like in the earliest concepts that man had, you know, existing in the heavens, in the star somewhere, in a star somewhere, let's say a closer star, eight light years away, imagine if prayer was governed by these physical laws that govern these universe, this universe, it would take eight years for the prayer to get to God, another eight years to get back. By then you might be dead, right? <laughs> not, not very effective. So obviously prayer needed to be, we ne it needed to be created the way God's created it, right? So let's look at the reception of God's love. God's love exists outside of all the universes, like we've mentioned here, right? Transformation principles allow for that love to be received by the soul in a desire state, which is in harmony with faith and truth, and it's a desire for the love that occurs. And these souls, then, as they receive this love, gain a bigger awareness of themselves. They are transformed into a larger state, gaining awareness of their potentials. Remember that the soul in an unaware state, or a six-fear state, as a perfect natural man, is not aware of its potentials. Right? It just thinks that where it is now is the pinnacle of its creation. Right? So if you talk to the average six-fear spirit, many of them, except for those ones who are now involved in the study of immortality, but even those think that the six-fear state is the end of it, they just need to get immortality somehow. They don't believe that immortality comes through a change of state. They believe immortality comes through a scientific analysis of all of the laws that may involve discovering immortality and then gaining it. Does that make sense to you? Not, not, so they're still in an unaware state from, of each other, really, even though many of them actually live together as soulmates and so forth. They're aware that there's such a thing as soulmates, but they don't know how to connect because they can't connect without God's love being received. So earlier, Laurie asked the question, why is it that you can't connect straight away after reaching the eighth state? Well, because there's more substances of God that the soul has to receive before, and more love from God that you have to receive before you can even contemplate how to connect to the other half of yourself in an aware state. Does that make sense? So you can't do it in a seventh, eighth sphere state. You have to continue to desire progress in order to make the connection. Make sense to you? Yeah. Okay. So the unaware soul does not exist and cannot exist in this universe. Does that make sense? You see why? Because the laws that 
govern this universe don't apply to the soul itself. Right? They only apply to the bodies that the soul has in connection with it. Right? The laws that govern the actual soul exist in a different universe completely. So, yeah, do you <laughs> hand up? Evan. Now, I don't want to lose you guys too much here with the. So, you know how we're inside of God? Yeah. That means our bodies at the moment, right now, is inside my soul. Yeah. Because it's part of. That's right. Your yeah. bodies right now are inside of your soul. Yeah, Both fantastic. your spirit. In fact, your physical body is inside of your spirit body, and your spirit body is inside your soul. Yeah, great. Thanks. So, you know how I've been drawing them like this in the past, you know, where you have your soul, and I've been drawing them like body, spirit body, yeah, and physical body with a cord in between, right? That's not really correct, is it? Uh, it helps for illustrative purposes, of course. But the real thing is that, no, the, the soul is in a different dimension and contains all 35 of the other dimensions. So as your spirit bodies even transist through the dimensions, your soul still encapsulates them. Does that make sense? Yeah. You can imagine there must be quite a lot of mathematics involved here, right? <laughs> we won't go into that, fortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Owen, you'd like to ask? What this brings up for me, um, and I can't put it into words, is like, like you said, it's like a, a ru I've sort of thought of them as being all separated, but we're in a kind of rubric screw, uh, cube of the whole, ev every mathematical thing, that, you know, it's kind of beyond me, but I can get a little grasp of Yeah. It, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, multidimensional space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, in the, in, in the end, of course, in your soul union state, you understand multidimensional space pretty good, right? Because you understand what's happening once you get to that state properly. Uh, before then, you have a growing awareness of multidimensional space. But, uh, and in fact, mathematics are a part of what you need to know about to achieve the union. But, but the r reality of it is becoming you can become aware of it quite fast as you receive god's love because god's love opens the soul's capacity to understand multi-dimensional space mm. yeah from a mathematical perspective as well as an emotional one oh. yeah okay. yeah Thanks. remember the two forms of communication god has the emotional one communication mm. and the mathematical yes. Yeah. So we understand it from both perspectives. So initially you start understanding these things from an emotional perspective. And so most celestial spirits start, uh, as they transist through the spheres after the eighth, they start understanding emotionally that there is multidimensional space and there is, the, you know, there is obviously a, the potentiality of a far greater connection with the other half of themselves that they're now developing inside of themselves a desire to achieve. As a result of that desire, they also see they must receive other substances from God in order to achieve that particular state. And as they receive those substances from God and the soul gets transformed into higher states of awareness, you have a higher capacity to calculate mathematically everything that's going on as well as emotionally. And so now you have a growing mathematical awareness of that state. Does that make sense? Until you reach the union state. Yeah. Thanks. Mary, you'd like to? Um, I feel like there's this question or this this feeling in the room, obviously I can feel it, of like, well, that's all well and good, but what does that mean for me right now? Yeah. Yeah. Well, is that how you feel? Or is that not how you feel? How do you feel? Overwhelmed, yes. <laughs> yeah, majority of people start feeling overwhelmed when they start seeing the whole thing. Now, bear in mind that many of you on Earth would never have ever been introduced to this material before ever in your whole life and in your future may not have ever been introduced this until you reach the you know 15th 16th 17th spheres of the spirit world and so i'm introducing concepts to people who don't have the love inside of them to absorb those concepts so you've got to be easy on yourself here right but 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 understand uh, i feel there's a few very basic things you need to understand from this principle the one basic thing is it's all driven by desire 
It has to be in harmony with truth and you need God's love to achieve it. Right? You also need to want the other half of yourself. Remember we discussed that in the second assistance group, the necessity of, of connecting with the other half of yourself. Does that make sense? That's the basic things that drive it emotionally. Now, you're not going to understand it physically for many years to come and mathematically perhaps for thousands of years to come. Do you follow? But, but at least you can start or begin to be open to the concept of it emotionally, which is an important part to you developing the desire. Remember, desire is faith that you can actually achieve it. And you have that faith now that you can do it, that it's possible. Right? Now, for many of you, it's going to take many, many years from now before you have that level of faith. That it's actually possible. Right? Until then, you will have many spirits around you who tell you it's possible. So they'll say, yes, it's definitely possible, particularly the spirits who have been through a fair portion of this process. You know, most celestial spirits beyond about the 14th or 15th spheres do believe this is possible. In, uh, as a faith-based experience, they do feel that it's possible. Of course, they're informed about it, usually as soon as they make the 8th sphere transition, but it takes many, many years even after that before you really feel that it's possible and really desire it. Right? Yeah. What, what the 14 are hoping to do is demonstrate that condition and what it looks like in the bodies on Earth, both the spirit and the physical <laughs> bodies. But of course that's an experiment that may fail. <laughs> so, you know, it's just... We'll see how it goes as to whether it's achieved or not. But getting back to the unaware soul, you can see the unaware soul, which is the soul that doesn't know, that can be partially aware, it does know of a soulmate, or unaware, where it's not incarnated yet or still on earth, uh, but it has incarnated but still unaware that it has another half. The unaware soul, obviously, sorry, only has doesn't have a concept of this universe existing. And in fact doesn't have a concept pretty much of most of these spheres existing except for usually the sphere it's in and any sphere under. So for those people on Earth, it doesn't have a concept of any other sphere other than those on Earth that, it, that it's actually existing in the physical. Which, as you can see, is a very limited concept. Right? Now, while you hold on to these concepts, can you see you're limiting yourself? So while you believe this is not possible, you will not engage the desire to m that makes it possible, uh, which is interesting in itself. Yeah. Okay. We've talked about those already, so let's go to the union condition. So the union condition obviously is this condition where we now know that we're unified. Of course, we've always been one soul. God didn't create two halves and put one half way over there and one half way over there and say, find each other. <laughs> That's, when you first heard of soulmates, isn't that what you thought? Yeah. Pretty much. Um, that's not how God, how, how, how unloving would that be? It's like, <laughs> no, God created one soul, put it together and said, right, you're just unaware of that condition. And when you incarnate, you have the experiential process of becoming aware, which is actually a joyful process, believe it or not. For many of you, it's not because of sin, right? Sin is what makes things painful. But you imagine that once you've reached the eighth sphere and you're free of sin, all forms of sin, including the sins against God, once you're in that condition, can you imagine it being painful, going to the ninth sphere or the tenth sphere? Wouldn't you just be experiencing joy after expanded joy after expanded joy? Yeah. So we've got to stop getting uh, this sort of real... Uh, when I talk about these things with you, many of you go, oh, oh how terrible is this? And I'm going, what, what, why is this so terrible? Like, this is part of a grow ba growing ex growth-based experience, development, the principle of development, which we learnt as one of the foundation principles, is constant change. Why aren't you getting used to constant change? You must have some 
resistance to constant change if you're not happy about the prospect of constant change. Right? And I would suggest to you it's a fear-based fear based feeling. If you're not happy with the prospect of constant change, it's because you're afraid of something, whatever that fear is. So the beauty of this soul in the aware state, man, it's got, who knows what potentials that's got? Like, we're yet to discover the potentials. At this stage, most of the people who were the first people to come into this union state have returned to each of these Earths. Right? So, so that means that, uh, that at some point, all of these there'll be a lot more people who know about these things, you know. So I'm sure on the other earth there's a person just like me in front of a group just like you. <laughs> Teaching, and I'm not saying they're you, <laughs> they're not a parallel, it's not parallel universe or anything, but, but they're just like you and that they want to learn about some of these things. And so someone like me, I wonder if he's finding it as resistive an audience <laughs> as I am, I'm not sure. But someone like me, and it might, it might be the feminine half of that, you know. It might not be the masculine half doing that on some of them. It might be the female half doing it mostly. Um, and they're just leading the process of a group of people who have returned to each one of those planets. Every one of them have had 14, seven pairs return um, to, to help the process of learning so that each one of these places have the potential to learn about these principles and actually engage them more fully. Right? Through, with knowledge and desire. <laughs> That's the goal. So can you see the transformation principles are pretty highly complex principles? You can see by its nature that it's governing pretty much all the physical laws and all the spiritual laws that govern the physical body and the spirit body are all governed by transformation principles. So they must be very, very highly complicated principles, right? Right? And in fact, being the highest of God's creation, the inbuilt rules that govern your soul are highly complicated rules as a result of the, you being the highest of God's creations. And the beauty is that you know, there are obviously the potential of a further exp expansion within the principles of God. So, so who knows how far that's going to go, but most likely it will be infinite given the fact that God's nature and principles all are infinite and God himself is the infinite entity. It makes sense that there is the possibility of infinite expansion within this universe, which really is not just one universe, eh? No, it's lots and lots and lots of them. Yeah, Rachel? Can I just ask the question, how much do the other Earths differ um, from our own in terms of their own development? They're in very similar states of development. Um, and really, the laws of love and equality dictate that. If you consider the permanence principle, the foundation principles we've discussed, love, truth, permanence in particular, can you see that it's highly likely that any other Earth, which has, uh, has is the forms the, you could call, it, the playground of the incarnated soul, right? That they are highly likely to be in the same state that we're we are in, aren't they? So it's highly likely, if you can imagine it, and they are. But but if you can imagine just from a theoretical perspective, it's highly likely, given the fact that each part of the universe receives the same amount of God's love at the same time, each part of the universe is governed by the same laws, each part of the universe come into existence probably at the same times because of the because of the desire of God. When God creates, he creates equally, then it's highly likely, can you not see, that that all of those particular earths must be in a similar state of development. Right. Yeah, thank you. And when I say similar, give or take a few thousand years, right? <laughs> yeah. I know it sounds a bit funny, but a few thousand, what's a few thousand years really? Not, not much at all, right? Yeah. So, yep. so, so desire for and reception of God's love is the human controlled mechanism by, by which transformation of the soul occurs. But remember, 
It can only occur while the gift of love is offered. If the gift was not being offered, can you see that you could have no end of desire for it and you're not going to receive it? Can you see that? Because a gift is a gift. Gifts can be offered and withdrawn, can't they? Yeah? You can still be loved even though you're not receiving a gift. Right? But the gift of God's personal love has been offered and it remains being offered for the moment. Can you think about how you feel about that? See, many of you sort of have this thing, what? You're saying that, that he's not always going to offer it? And I'm saying, well, why? why would he? You don't know. I've always felt right from the first century that God would close the offer because it is a gift. And I still feel that, actually. So that's interesting. I'm not certain, but I do feel that the return of all of these pairs to these different earths is probably the four running events associated with the closing of the gift. Where people who desire this to stay in this state of partial awareness in the sixth sphere remain in that state. They could potentially remain in state forever, although that's highly unlikely too, because God, being an infinite being, probably is going to offer the gift again. But who knows how long it might be. You imagine you live for infinitely. You could wait a few hundred thousand years, couldn't you, before you're offered again? You could wait a few tens of, you know, million years, couldn't you, before you're offered again? Who knows? You see? So we don't know, given that God, it's triggered by God's personal personality and nature. And as I've said, we've still got a lot to discover about that personality and nature. You'd like to ask, Karen? How does the potential withdrawal of the gift fit with God wanting us to be happy? Well, every six fear spirit would say they're happy. God doesn't want us to be happier than that. Well, no, we didn't want to be happier than that. So you see, you see, Karen, you're forgetting who's making the decisions. Yeah, yeah. Aren't you? Yeah. It's like, it's like saying, you know, it's like with the sin issue, you know, with the authority issue we discussed last night. There's obviously a deep resistance inside the audience to see they have authority over some things. Mm. One of the things you have authority over, as we wrote on the board, was your desire. Right? So can you then say that God's withdrawal of the gift is, 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 is like somehow your inability now to receive the gift is, is God's fault? Do you think God wouldn't... If, if, if there's no one on earth with the desire to receive it, then surely that would be one thing that means that God can't offer it, isn't it? That's what I thought you... Und I, that's what I understood. You said previously that the gift wasn't offered because there was no desire. Yep. So it would take an, a person... But don't, don't you think, with Ammon and Amman, the very first couple, they had the gift offered right at the beginning. So 160,000 years ago, they had the gift offered. And, and they rejected the gift. Mm -hmm. And from that time to the first century, so we're talking, what, 160... 158,000 years or so, God didn't offer the gift again. Because there wasn't enough desire in the human being. No, you see, this is where you're mistaken. When you say because, no, it's not because there wasn't enough desire in the human being. It's because that's when God decided to offer the gift. And fortunately, there was enough desire in at least one human being to receive it at that time. Does that make sense? Yeah. But, but the reality is that if, there, if I had lived 500 years earlier and desired it, but God hadn't offered it, then I wouldn't have got it. It's a gift. You can't assume that just because you've got, got to have a desire for it, you're going to get it. To assume that means you have a demand. Yeah. And therefore, 
you, your desire is not pure. Yeah. Can you see that? To assume that. So let's say I lived 500 years earlier, like 5,500 BC. By that stage, God still had not offered the gift. So if I, even if I had developed a desire or a knowledge that it was possible to receive it, would I have received it? I would not have. Does that make sense to you? Because it's a gift. It's not something I can demand from God. I can desire it. Now, we've learned that God does respond to desires. So who knows? God might have decided at that time, oh, because this person has a desire, I will offer it. Right? But, but that, that's only a presumption. It's not. So God really wants us to learn the lesson that it is a gift. To learn the lesson that it's a gift and to learn the lesson of taking, desiring gifts when they're offered. Yeah. Taking, and what you would call that is taking opportunities. Wouldn't you call that? Yeah. Yes. Many of you don't realise the opportunity you have. Even now, you still don't. You're in this big resistive process of, oh, how bad is this? How terrible is this? Oh, coming to face to face, my sin is not terrible. It's not terrible. It's an opportunity. But you're seeing it as terrible. This is part of the attitude issue that needs to change. You're seeing something that's actually a gift. But as you've learnt earlier in the day with, from, with Jacob, when Mary was channeling Jacob, you learnt that there's a man who didn't know about this gift for 160 years. Now, what do you think he feels about it now? <laughs> do, you, do you think he, like, can you see he would rather have known 160 years ago? Yeah. Right? Of course. That's how he feels. But he didn't take the opportunities that were offered. So... There's some lesson there, isn't there? Yeah. Take the opportunities that are offered. Yeah. Yeah. It's not as hard as anybody would think because I think one of the questions you asked, Karen, in the, in the question session is, you know, this is making me feel like there's, it's harder and harder for me to ever become one with God. No, it's easier and easier. You now know how to achieve it and you now know that there's only really a few basic things you need to do emotionally that need to change in order to achieve it. Now, having that knowledge is like, isn't that a wonderful gift in itself? Just the knowledge itself. Of course it is. So why do you keep seeing it as some trauma every time you hear a new truth? It doesn't make any sense, does it, really? It's not a trauma. It's new, more knowledge. As Mary said to you right in the beginning with one of her uh, homework sessions, she said, more information is always going to be to your benefit. Right? Always going to be. This is information to your benefit. Now, if the average child was taught these particular principles from the day they were born... By the time they were five or six or seven years of age and they had a developed intellect, can you see they would have the choice to develop desire and start receiving from God? How, how fr much freer would their life be? Man, you, it's like they wouldn't have to go through this process of even removing much sin, would they? Just bit pieces here and it would be gone. And Because usually it's after we've become seven or eight years of age that we start engaging our own desires and then we start sinning through our own choices, you know, so they don't only have to release some of the stuff from mum and dad, you know, get rid of that, and they'd, they've already got a very strong connection with doing it. If mum and dad allowed them to cry whenever they needed to, it would be a very simple process. And who knows, by the time they're 10 or 12, they might have caught up with their soulmate and found, found their soulmate, and uh, they've already, by, by, by the time they're five, they'd have their own business, um, <laughs> wouldn't need mum and dad. I had three businesses by the time I was five. More, more by, the, by the time I was seven. I started my businesses when I was four, and by the time I was seven, I had three of them. Right? And I could live on them. I could. Fortunately, my mum and dad still had money to buy food, so what I did is I went <laughs> and bought other things I really wanted to do, like cameras and, you know. Other, other things that I were enjoy, were, wanted to enjoy. I bought holidays for the family and all sorts of things. But, but you know, yeah, imagine if you were by seven years of age, you had a business that you could 
do, you have the intellectual development of an average adult nowadays, or, or better, because you've got no emotional injuries, therefore you've got emotional intelligence. At the moment, hardly any of us got any emotional intelligence. And, and so you imagine what we could achieve just in that state. So we need to start seeing this as a... <laughs> like, this is wonderful to know these things. It's not terrible. Yeah. yeah. Rebecca? In the first century, um, how did you, so you, no one was teaching you this and you kind of walked around nature and felt there was... It's not was true that no one was teaching me God this. was teaching you. Yes, that's true. <laughs> Just <laughs> like God can teach you this. So, um, and what, this might be a silly question, but what was your first formulated prayer like? Uh, I don't know if I can remember my first formulated prayer. I was praying before I really had an intellectual concept of what prayer was. So I had feelings from God and feelings for God that I had before, I was, way before I was seven years of age. I can remember having them when I was three in the first century. So probably before then even. Um, so yeah, it's just the f feelings that I had, which, which remember is all about desires projected at God, are prayers, are they not? And then, and if they're pure, which a child's usually are quite pure, aren't they? So it's quite easy to re then receive something from God. I didn't realise at the time that that's what I was receiving, this love. I had to, you know, after time, time after I learned, by the time I was five, I started to have some concept. But, but between five and ten was when I really started to grasp that it was love that I was receiving because I felt so great <laughs> receiving it, you know what I mean? And, and I also contrasted it with what I was feeling from the world around me, which was a lot of obviously uh, really dark emotions. So it was easy for me to feel that, yeah, this was love that I was feeling from, from this being that I didn't really call God, I just called him Daddy, you know, like, um, yeah. So is my... He's my daddy, you know, just like he's yours. And, 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 you know, that's my first concept. Then I started to sort of see, because of the masculine and feminine injuries, that she, he was also my mother, so she was my mother. So I started calling her mummy as well. Um, but that's a process that grew over time. So by the time I was 10, I was doing that. Um, but still learning a lot in the process, yeah. That's how it should be naturally for all of all of us, right? It's not because of sin, really. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so if we get a look at what we do with this principle, obviously, man, this principle is pretty much those who think they know it don't know it, and those who think it doesn't, most don't think it exists at all. Um. So you could say probably Christians are the only people who have been introduced to the concept and they think they know it, but they don't know it. So you can see it's a, there's, a major, there's major problems with this principle on earth. And remember, rejecting God rejects this principle. It's not only rejecting God, but rejecting God's personality rejects this principle. So if you believe God is a punishing God, a wrathful God who's going to come and destroy the wicked, you're rejecting the principle. It's not what God's going to do. It's not the truth about God. It's not about God's nature. Rejecting God's love, rejecting God's truth, rejecting God's principles and laws, rejecting faith. Can you see the problem with some very, what we believe on earth are very minor decisions that have no real impact on our life? That's what we believe. Like most people on earth who believe rejecting God has no real impact on their life on earth, right? Or rejecting the concept of faith has no real impact on earth and God's truth what's that there's no such thing as absolute truth in the in the concept of most people so these are all basic decisions most people are making by the time they're 10 they've already made these decisions most people on earth right they've rejected these things and yet they have the most severe long-term impact on the rest of our existence isn't that interesting the very decisions we've made and rejected while very, very young, the most severe long-term impact on the rest of our existence. And of course, we could keep going, couldn't we? 
rejecting the potential of spiritual afterlife, agnostic or atheistic beliefs, religious beliefs in disharmony with God's love and truth, willfully engaging unloving behaviour, desiring ignorance. <laughs> These are things we commonly do, right? And as I said, most of us do have done them and made these decisions and choices way, you know, what, usually in our childhood or in our adolescent years, and yet they have the most, the most impact upon our future enjoyment of life and our future potential to expand. Yeah. Amazing, huh? Yeah. So there we have the transformation principles. Wonderful principles, huh? Yeah. And, and remember, these principles made the potentiality of God a being able to give us gifts. That you could think of, in summary, as the transformation principles exactly that. The transformation principles create the potential for the human soul to receive gifts directly from God. That's what they do. And they, because of that, they are the most incredible, the most incredible principles, really. The ability now not only to live within the universes God creates and the potential future universes God creates, but, but also the potential to actually directly receive personal gifts from God. Right? is what these principles enable. Mm. So that's something to think about. So what we're going to do now is have a 30-minute break for lunch and, and we will discuss, we will do a Q&A on the subject of transformation principles. I think I've allowed an hour for them as well, or close to that. So hopefully we'll get to answer so many of the uh, principles that, or things that you've asked about transformation principles during that process. Thanks, guys. Have a good lunch. Thank you. Thank you.